Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everybody this morning. Or well, you see me. How about that? So good to see, good to see you. Glad you're joining. Uh, it's uh, Thursday, April, and still in the Book of John. Uh, still in the Book of John. We're gonna we're gonna kind of pick up where we left off yesterday in John chapter six, verses uh, fifty three to fifty eight, where we talked about. Um, uh, how the day Jesus lost his crowd. So we're going to talk a little deeper about that today and then finish up tomorrow talking about uh, uh, something I titled, uh, John, the lesson number 22. It's uh, it's the he devil. (laughs) It's the he devil. So we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Now, uh, Let's see. Glad everybody's uh, here. I hope you're uh, you're ready for this morning. <clears throat> Pardon my voice a little bit. The uh, the uh, the grill smoke uh, gets to my voice sometimes, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I ate one of the hamburgers last night after after service. Uh, it was tasty. So we ate our own cooking, and it was good. <laughs> So uh, don't forget this coming Wednesday or this next Wednesday, we're going to have we're going to have what did I say? Meatloaf, uh, smashed potatoes, and then we're going to have the and the pickup time is is changed a little bit. We're not making it so early. It's going to be from four until five thirty from four until five thirty. Okay. So that'll give us a time to uh, uh, to make sure the meal is hot and you can take it home and it's going to be good. All right. <clears throat> now, let's see what else. I think I had one more thing. I was oh uh, yeah, coming up Mother's Day. Uh, this Mother's Day is coming up a week from Sunday. Believe it or not, Mother's Day is already here. So what we're going to do is have a special gift for all the mothers. Okay, for every every mom that comes. Uh, comes to drive in church on Mother's Day. We'll have a special gift. It's all been wrapped, and uh, it's just a it's just a small token uh, for our mamas, so that we can just appreciate that. And for for all ladies, eighteen and older. So uh, it, we do this for for all ladies. We do that every year uh, for all ladies, eighteen years old and older. Whether you're a mama or not, um, you you might be a mama one day. So we we just wanted to honor you. To, um, a week from Sunday for Mother's Day. All right. Well, here we go. Let's dig in just a little bit. Last time uh, we talked about how churches put a lot of emphasis on drawing a crowd. So, <clears throat> but but Jesus did not. Okay. He had big attendance days, but his overall trend was advancement through decline. Okay. Uh, the the kind of a, a phrase that that I found and, and we used quite, quite often yesterday was a faith that fizzles. Before the finish was faulty from the first. Okay, a face that a face. I keep saying the face. I'm so sorry. Your face fizzles. Um, a faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. Wow, that's a tongue twister. Now, uh, and, and again, there's there's uh, you know uh, again, if your ultimate purpose is simply to draw a crowd and nothing else. Uh, then you're you're then then you're in it for the wrong thing, okay? Uh, crowds will come as we share the gospel, okay? Uh, so, do we want more people? Do I want more people uh, to attend church and to, you know, uh, eventually when we're back on campus, do we want to grow the church? Absolutely, uh, but that's but my primary concern as a pastor is that we see souls saved and lives changed. Okay. Every person, every soul is precious to God. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, in a couple of weeks, um, it's, it's mother's day. And so let's take a little survey. Um, ladies, raise your hand. If you know what selective hearing is, <laughs> you say something like, eh, take out the trash. Or pick up your clothes. I know, man, just can't hear those things. And you can use the same tone and volume and say, would you like some ice cream? And boy, you'd be heard with no problem. Uh, hey, would you like to get romantic? Yes. And you're done. You know, would you like to get romantic? Of course, you can hear those things, right? Well, 
unfortunately, many who claim to be followers of, of Christ, I think, have selective hearing. Uh, they only want to hear what, uh, and those are the things that they agree with. They, they don't challenge them too deeply. See, a, a, a man of God, a preacher, can preach truths from the same Bible, but one is heard and the other is ignored. And that's really called, that's called selective hearing. Now, the, the crowd in chapter six that we've read, yes, started reading about yesterday, they had selective hearing. Uh, it was a big crowd. They came to see miracles. They came to get fed. They came to join uh, to join in that kind of trend of the day, you know. But Jesus wanted to see who was serious. And so he preached on commitment. Uh, and that's when, well, that's when the party was over. Oh, you want us to do something. Um, by the way, it doesn't mean that they were not saved, but undoubtedly, many of them were only in it for what they could get out of it. And that's what uh, we have to caution. There's people that are that, you know, when they come, I've seen over the years, there's people that have come into the church and it, it, it's as if, you know, and I've heard the phrase before, uh, I think I'll give this Jesus stuff a try. OK, well, um, it, it, and again, what that does is that that's got they've gotten to the to their bottom and they, they don't have anywhere else to turn. But, hey, we'll try this anyway. I don't believe it's going to work, but we'll try it anyway. OK. So uh, I believe, well, let's look at verses 53 and 54, okay, in John chapter 6, and then we'll go on just a minute. Uh, it says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink, of, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Um, one thing we have in this country, we have what, what I like to call uh, easy believism. And it's pretty common. So here's, you know, here's what it is. It's, you know, it's uh, uh, say a prayer and we'll say you're saved. OK, all you got to do is say a prayer. There's there's uh, there's a church that I've got in my mind thinking of. It's a, it's a quite large church um, and they used to go door to door. And I don't know if they still do or not, but they'd go door to door. And uh, they were trained, the people were trained to put their foot in the door uh, to make sure that the people couldn't close the door on them. Uh, so they could, and what they would do is they'd say, uh, you know, hey, I'm here. Talk about, you know, if, if you die today, would you go to heaven? Which is not a bad thing. But what they would do is, is they would, you know, in order to get rid of them, uh, the people would say, okay, what do I need to do? And so they, you know, lead them in this sinner's prayer and they, they'd mark it down on a tally sheet. Oh, I got one saved. That's good. Um, and so people went back. There was a, a study done. People went back to, to kind of see what had happened. They did a study. They went back to see, you know, why, you know, if all these people were being saved, why wasn't, you know, this particular church, you know, this particular church should have been, you know, 25, 30,000 people. Well, what happened was, uh, is, uh, like I said earlier, the, the people were saying, hey, we simply just said the prayers to get them off, get them off our backs. Right. Uh, and, and they asked me, they said, well, you know, they told him about Jesus. They said, well, I've already got it. I'm already taken care of because that guy told me so. OK, uh, see, that's that's easy believism. That's that's say a prayer and we'll mark it down on our chart and we'll we'll put a feather in our cap. Right. But but James chapter two, verse 19 says this. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, right? Um, so does the Bible really mean when it tells us to believe and be saved? Well, believing in the head is called mental assent. It's just believing the facts. See, the demons believe the facts. Look at Matthew 8, 29. It says, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Those were demons uh, that were talking back to Jesus, right? And even the demons know Jesus to be who he claims to be. They, they knew exactly who he was, but they, but they certainly aren't saved. It was demonic faith that they had, right? So James tells us faith without works is dead. It's a dead faith and works give evidence of salvation, okay? Um, it, it's not the root, but the fruit, okay? And Jesus said, we're known by our fruit. The person with a dead faith has has only had an intellectual experience. 
see, in his mind, he knows facts about salvation. But in his heart, he's never truly applied those things with a personal commitment. See, he knows the right words, but he, he can't back them up with word, with works. Um, true faith brings life. And the characteristics of life are growth and fruit. It says so in, in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. It says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's a sad phrase. He says, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. Many are going to say to me that, that day, Lord, Lord, ha have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. Um, and, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. See, that's the deceptive faith. See, we talked about a demonic faith, but this is a deceptive faith. When you do works and think you're saved because of the works. So we need the real thing. We need dynamic faith. Um, see, that touches everything. Mind, heart, and will. So it's got to go from, from our head to our heart. And, and, and then on to the hand to, do, to, to work, to go and do. See, this happens through making a real commitment which means true repentance being part of your faith in Christ. See, you turn from sin and turn to Jesus. Now, demonic faith only affects the mind. It understands the facts of salvation. Now, you know about Jesus, but, but you don't know him personally. And it has nothing to do with the heart. If I asked you if you know the president, you would probably say yes, because you know about him and you know who he is. But now the question is, do you know him personally? Would you like to? See, a dead faith. That was a demonic faith. This is a, Here's a dead faith. It may involve the heart, but it doesn't reach the hand. And what I mean by that is you may have prayed a prayer of salvation. You may have even cried as, at, at the decision that affected you emotionally. It reached your heart, but not your will. If there's no surrender and commitment involved, it isn't full. It's, it, it's not a dynamic faith. So here's, let me talk about the deceptive faith a little deeper. Deceptive faith does works. So the will is involved. But, but the hand and the hand takes action. But, but see, it's not real and it's not rooted in the heart. See, its motive is doing works in order to be a good person and to earn salvation instead of being rooted and grounded in the heart. Everybody understand? Everybody see that? Believe and commit are synonymous in the biblical sense. See, a person may say they've decided to be saved, but if it results in no change, if there's no fruit, if there's no desire to go in the right direction, the Bible gives us little encouragement about the reality of that decision. Vance Havner says this. He says, I didn't understand much about trusting Jesus, but I understood one thing. And no theologian had to explain it to me. I understood that I was under new management. That was perfectly clear. I had a new Lord. I believe. I believe that the sad state of Christians and churches today is due to cheap believism and doesn't be, that doesn't believe and a cheap receive in it, re, <laughs> receiveism that doesn't that doesn't receive. See, after all, the, the word savior is found only 24 times in the New Testament. And the word Lord is applied to Jesus 433 times. Now. Back to the passage. Let's go back to the passage for just again. So when he says you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, is he teaching transubstantiation? No. Uh, here's what uh, here's what transubstantiation is. It's th there's some that believe in, in the Catholic Church. They believe this as well. If the that the elements become literal flesh and blood. OK, well, if the elements that we partake on the Lord's Supper become literal flesh and blood, then what would we have? What would we have? 
it would not just be a symbolic remembrance. It would be a sacrifice. And, and that would be heresy. And that would be blasphemy against our, our smitten Savior. Here, Hebrews chapter 10, starting in, in verse 12 and verse 14, says, But this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, okay, sat down on the right hand of God. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Let me tell you, there, there's not a there's no saving virtue in the elements, okay, of of the Lord's Supper. It's a symbolic remembrance of the once and for all sacrifice Jesus made. And then he said, it is finished. And and it is finished. See, he, he's no longer on the cross. See, we need to live in light of the empty tomb. Now, transubstantiation was was invented by Catholic leaders in 1200. Now, so for more than a millennium, the church got along fine without it. And then in 1520, Martin Luther said it was a monstrous word for a monstrous idea. So if Jesus was talking about the Lord's Supper in this passage, then it would mean you have to partake in order to be saved. And you don't have to partake in the Lord's Supper to be saved. It is a remembrance of what he's done, his sacrifice on the cross. Does everybody see that? See, Jesus makes it clear that he's speaking spiritually and not literally by going to verse 63 in John chapter 6. It says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Okay. Now, uh, let's. This is this is. Uh, let, let's also go further. Okay, the, the the phrase "eat my flesh and drink my blood" are in the uh, the aorist a o r i s t the aorist tense, and it means do it one time. It's a once and for all partaking, and it's not to be repeated. Okay, as we partake, it's a time of reflection. We're looking back and then looking forward, okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, it, it tells us, okay? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, okay? Looking back till he come, looking forward, okay? Now, uh, here's the thing. As we look back, we remember that though our salvation is free, it was not cheap. The bread, it symbolizes his broken body. And, and the cup is a picture of his blood shed for us. We not only look back, but we look forward till he come. Now, at the last supper, Jesus told his disciples, I won't partake of this with you again until we are together in my kingdom. Friends, wouldn't it be wonderful if the next time we partook, it was in heaven with Jesus? Wouldn't that be amazing? Did you know you can find uh, communion in your Old Testament? You say, well, what do you mean? It's the Passover. See, and that first time the children of Israel partook, they were in slavery in Egypt. They were told to receive it with their coats on. Because they needed to be ready to what? To vacate. They were getting ready to move. Huh. We need to live the same way. We need to live the same way. Hmm. Well, friends, that's our study for today, this morning. Uh, some studies are a little shorter. Some are a little longer. This one just happened to be a little shorter. Not much. Uh, but again, good to have you all with me this morning. Uh, I really appreciate everybody, and I appreciated everybody coming. Uh, one of the reasons that we're, that I, I that I started uh, the drive-through cafe uh, is I, I missed everybody. I like to say hello, <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm grateful that that folks came and I was able to see folks and uh, at a distance, of course. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so again, don't forget next Wednesday you can already start calling in your orders. Uh, next Wednesday is meatloaf, smashed potatoes, and green beans. Uh, there's uh, we get rave reviews about our smashed potatoes and the meatloaf. We get pretty good reviews on, too. So uh, praise the Lord for that. Now, uh, Friday night, don't forget, we have movie night. 
That's uh, at 7.30, so everybody be there by 7.30. So it might be about 7.40. Um, as, as the days get longer, we have to kind of move the time a little bit so we can see the screen a little bit better. I'm going to have a movie on movie night. We're going to have one uh, that'll be good for the kids as well as the adults, okay? So uh, keep that in mind. It's gonna, it's, so it'll be, it'll be a, great, a great movie. Uh, that uh, that we'll have an opportunity to watch. And then on Sunday, drive in church uh, this coming Sunday at 1030. So don't forget about that. All right. Also, don't forget Saturday. And I forgot the time. I'll have a robo call out. Uh, Pastor Terry is is going to be doing a a Bible study. Uh, uh, and I'm, uh, he hasn't said what he's doing yet, uh, but uh, just getting him used to keep coming on to Facebook Live and uh, and YouTube. But he'll be just on Facebook. OK, it'll be on the church's Facebook uh, page. So uh, we, we've got him lined up and ready to go. Uh, so hopefully he'll get that. He'll get that going on Saturday. And I'll tell you the time so everybody can tune in. OK, uh, so keep that in mind. All right. Well, friends. Uh, know that I love you and know uh, that I want you to stay safe. Uh, the, the, the end of, of, uh, of restrictions are coming to an end. And so we, we can see the horizon. Don't lose faith. Uh, and and we'll, we, we know that, we'll, that one day soon we'll be able to meet together in the church house. OK, uh, I love you. Have a blessed day.